afternoon, a beautiful afternoon. Um, my ambition for the next hour to hour and a half is to talk with you about inequality, to talk with you about a book I'm writing on inequality, and perhaps a, a subtext is to raise the question, as ever, what is to be done? Because um, I think when you come across economic and social problems uh, and you analyse them, there is, I think, ethically a, an imperative to act, or at least consider action in the light of, of, of the, the evidence that is thereby revealed. So I hope that it'll be interesting to see how uh, these questions in, interrelate with each other. In other words, the analysis of inequality, the way in which one constructs a book about it, and the implications of that for political action. Just getting another way. The other thing I should say by way of a preface is uh, that all academic activity is essentially uh, collective and cumulative. Uh, I'm very conscious of that, of course, working in the <coughs> university environment, in a department of political economy, good colleagues, good students around the place. All of that gives a sort of ferment for shared ideas. Seminars like this, I think, fit comfortably in that, in that environment as an integral part of it. Um, but so too, uh, there's a broader uh, penumbra of scholars who are actively engaged in, in, in shared concerns, and certainly in relation to inequality, that's manifestly the case. I mean, everyone knows of Thomas Pinkerty's book, for example, uh, which uh, is, is huge and uh, arguably little read, but uh, very influential, if nothing else, in spawning a whole array of other books. So, uh, not that Tony Atkinson, for example, who also wrote a marvellous book about inequality, uh, needed much encouragement or spawning, because he spent his whole academic career uh, uh, on, on this topic. Among other things, just as an aside, uh, I might say he was the supervisor of Anne Harding, who, and I'm catching Chris Shields eye here, and Harding was instrumental in setting up the uh, uh, NATSEM in Canberra, the National Centre for Economic and Social Modelling. Um, and uh, one of our earliest students in the political economy program went and uh, under his supervision completed a PhD on economic inequality way, way back. So, cumulative, as well as collective elements are involved in all uh, scholarly work in, within universities. And in my own case, I, I've been thinking about and researching the field of inequality for a long, long time. And so coming to write a book uh, at this point is an opportunity to synthesize other people's work, put it in my own uh, analytical framework, and uh, consider what is to be done. The uh, sequence of the story is, uh, oh, wait a minute, I'm ups and downs. The sequence of the story is familiar enough, uh, the five P's, uh, patterns, is that clear enough to see? Yeah, the light I'm making a bit, I'm trying to try to reduce it, but it's... Yeah, I don't mind doing it. You can the front lights on. Yeah, that's, I'm trying, but... There you go. There you go. Yeah. That's it. Oh, yeah. Perfect. begin at the beginning. <laughs> Imagine you're watching a parade of the whole of the world's population. There's nearly five billion adults and they all walk past you within one hour. The height of each person is proportional to their annual income. One centimetre 
per hundred euros. Let's be European about this. <laughs> Although it'll be a while before any Europeans appear. The poorest people come first in this parade and the wealthiest people come last. As the parade lasts only 60 minutes, watching the whole world's population walk past is like watching a fantastically speeded up video. Uh, at the other extreme, poor people, where poverty may be defined either in absolute terms or in relative terms, but also including some people who are indeed wage earners, not marginalised from the economic system uh, in, in general, but uh, getting insufficient income to uh, live above the poverty line. And of course in the middle, uh, middle income people, I've avoided using the term class at this stage in the argument because the concept of class doesn't necessarily uh, apply when you're simply looking at distributions of income or wealth. Let's move on. Keep moving on backwards. Some fundamental parts of the story, drawing on evidence from Piketty and, and his colleagues. This you might at first sight think is a rather strange next step in the argument to look at that box that was in the top corner of the previous diagram uh, labelled public wealth. Well, I think this is the most fundamentally important element of all because uh, to somewhat anticipate the, the <coughs> policy punchline of this story, if you've got good public wealth, good public infrastructure, schools, hospitals, public transport, public housing, then in a way the private inequalities in society wouldn't matter so much. So it's the hollowing out of public <coughs> wealth which really makes inequality of private incomes and private wealth that much more important. And the dominant trend is clear. China, instead, is the top line in this uh, picture, uh, a so-called communist state that has effectively embraced capitalist economic principles, privatisation of public enterprises, and so <coughs> on, uh, taking the wealth down, albeit to levels still very much higher than uh, elsewhere in capitalist nations. But the trend everywhere in the last uh, 40 years or so has been downwards towards shrinking public wealth. Privatisation and neoliberalism are of course the key part in the story. The next step in the argument is to look at the evidence on the functional distribution of income. Those shares of capital, labour, land, uh, depicted here with the focus on labour share. The, the data comes from the International Monetary Fund and is, again, worldwide. When I was a student, when this diagram began, 1970, uh, I just finished my PhD at that time, uh, it was conventional among economists uh, to say, well, labour share in the national income is, over long periods of time, pretty well constant. This was what was generally called a stylized fact. Well, we now know, with the benefit of some 40 years uh, hindsight, that uh, stylised, yes, but fact, no. Uh, Labour share has been declining. There's a lot of literature and discussion about why that has been the case, but I think, as a fact, it's not uh, uh, strongly in dispute. Indeed, the next issue of the Journal of Australian Political Economy, ladies and gentlemen, is going to be on this very issue, uh, co-edited uh, with uh, Jim Stanford, who uh, works with the Centre for Future Work at, at the Australian Institute and is very much in, in, engrossed in analysing these trends and their implications for Australia. <coughs> Next step, again drawing on Piketty, uh, looking at what's been happening among the top 10% of income earners. 
they've been doing nicely across a wide range of countries. Uh, look at the, the purple Russia. Wow. Uh, around 1990, something happened. <laughs> was so Union and the, the oligarchs helped themselves to the state assets. And, so uh, this was a rather one-off situation, <laughs> but the more general trend across uh, a range of disparate countries has been for incomes to be increasingly concentrated at the top end. Now, if you put these stories together uh, and try to look at the global income distribution, you see a rather interesting picture emerging. The global income distribution is a bit hard to get your head around, but uh, you can, and I should point out that the horizontal axis here does uh, have a logarithmic scale. In other words, it stretches out markedly to the right-hand side. I'll come back to that in a moment. But the general picture is clear that uh, based on Milanovic's assembly of an enormous amount of data from different countries around the world over this uh, significant uh, period of time. A lot of people are richer than they used to be. This middle part of the story is India and China, essentially. People who used to be desperately poor, who in some cases now are not so poor. They typically have incomes, as you see, looking at the bottom, uh, the horizontal axis, of around 1,000 to 3,000, maybe even up to 10,000 a year. Not rich by Australian, European and North American standards, but a lot richer than they used to be. So the world income distribution is not quite so peaked, and it's got fatter in its middle range. But something very interesting has been happening at the top, too, although you wouldn't get it from just looking at this particular diagram. Milanovic highlighted this better in what has come to be known as the elephant curve, for obvious reasons. The fat body of the... Where's my little point? The fat body of the elephant, uh, the drooping head, and the rampant... Uh, Proboscis. What do you call it? Truck. Truck. <laughs> <laughs> truck, truck. Oh, yeah. yeah, a lot of people have done a lot better. The ones who, according to this uh, depiction, have been missing out have been typically people who are towards the upper end of the distribution. Okay. Come on in. You're welcome. The working class of North America and uh, Europe and Australasia have been doing quite as well in terms of their income gains as other people have around the world. Um, others have been catching up. Wage stagnation uh, has been commonplace in uh, Western countries, uh, so-called Western, um, and even provoking uh, directors of central banks to say that this is a problem for the future of capitalism and that workers should be out there campaigning and bargaining for higher wages because uh, the economy depends upon it. Well, something of a turn up for the book. The same data has been updated a little by Piketty and his colleagues uh, and put on a somewhat different representation which has the unfortunate effect of making the elephant disappear or at least it's got a longer, longer and wavier trunk because you can see by looking carefully at that horizontal axis that the top 10% of the distribution is now stretched out. So we've got uh, the... Uh, 90% mark here, 99.0, 99 99.9, 99.99, and then 99.999. So you're starting to see 
how well the one percent is doing relative to the ten percent at the top, and within that one percent, the 0.1 percent and the 0.11 percent, and uh, you then get a clearer picture uh, that it's not just the the working class, so to speak, of, of the Western capitalist countries that's been experiencing the stagnation. The contrast between their position and the continued increase in wealth uh, uh, of the uh, the top bracket uh, is yet more striking. Piketty uh, had already picked that up, uh, I think, to some extent, in his analysis of wealth inequalities in rich countries. Uh, but again, this one's going back to looking at capital share uh, over the period in time. The diagram is a little confusing because so many countries are depicted there. Uh, Australia is in the mix. A new article by <coughs> Chris Shield is going to pull that out more clearly. <coughs> Piketty, actually, although his focus is primarily on wealth and his major analytical contribution is to direct our attention to the wealth inequalities that underpin the income inequalities. Also, I think it gives us some very interesting information about what's happening to inequalities within capital and within labour. This uh, chart that I've simply lifted out of Piketty's work uh, is, I think, particularly useful in that regard. The top line just uh, shows pretty much what was in the previous diagram for the United States. It shows uh, that uh, since the, about 1950, the uh, top decile, that's the top 10% of uh, income earners, have increased their share of US total income from around 35% up to 50%. In other words, uh, this is a quite dramatic surge in the uh, share of the total income going to the top 10%. The, the strong driving factor, it seems to me, is this lower line here, which shows the, the inequalities among wage earners. In other words, the share of the top 10% of wage earners among uh, total wage earners has gone up from 25... Whoops, I didn't realise it was screen sensitive. Um, it's gone up from 25 to... 35%, and that really is quite a dramatic surge. So these, I think, give us a pretty clear uh, depiction of what's been going on. Uh, plenty of other data sources too. I just pulled out this one from uh, Bloomberg's uh, Global Survey of Billionaires. This is switching back into the wealth uh, aspect too. So 155 billionaires in the United States of America. Uh, the BRICS are right up there, rather interesting. Brazil, Russia, India, China, a whole lot of billionaires. The BRICS are doing very handsomely in, in, in this particular league table. Australia's in there down towards the, uh, the middling range. A cut off uh, every country below. Uh, six, because we haven't got six billionaires, you're not really a country. <laughs> <laughs> the between country variations is very interesting. Uh, so I think any analysis of inequality has to blend its consideration of the global patterns with the the the, 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 the mosaic of of, of intra-country differences. The United States comes out uh, remarkably different on almost every measure. This is the global picture of how the top 1% has been doing nicely, how the global bottom 50% has been doing <coughs> pretty stable. <coughs> In other words, as we all move up a bit as a result of India and China, the, the global average moves up, but the share of the bottom 50% uh, remains roughly stable, whereas the share of the top 1% uh, 
goes very nicely. In the United States, this is the, the, the picture. This, this is what I say, the extreme case. The share of the bottom 50% has been plunging, plunging, down over a 35-year uh, period from 22% down to about 13%. Uh, and the share of the top 1% has been surging up from about 11% uh, up to over 20% of total income. Compare that with the situation in Western Europe. In Western Europe, the top 1% uh, share has been growing, but nowhere near as rapidly as in the States. And the top, uh, and the share of the bottom 50% has been falling just a smidgen over, over the period as a whole, and not at all over the last uh, 20 years. So these are really important differences in uh, the situation, the United States and European models. And uh, being in Australia, well, not for the first time, one asked the question, which road do we want to take? Uh, this isn't, the European road isn't a revolutionary alternative. It's just a somewhat more social democratic take on capitalism compared with the United States. I think the story also has to be made more complex by drilling down to see who's who among these uh, different groups of people who are rich, poor, uh, in between, uh, doing better, doing worse. And uh, uh, obviously if one was to disaggregate according to, to location, class, gender, race, age, one would get a much, much more complex uh, mosaic in the story. In my book, I've simply devoted one chapter, uh, one might say a little tokenistic, to considerations of <coughs> how personal uh, characteristics uh, situate you in, in these broader uh, political economic trends. Just to give one small <coughs> example, here's the gender wage gap. Uh, compared internationally, you might observe that Japan and Korea have strikingly big uh, gender wage gaps, <coughs> particularly interested in the case of Japan because it's in general a fairly egalitarian society in terms of the overall distribution of income and wealth. It's up there with the Nordic states as being the most egalitarian on the planet. But when it comes to gender inequalities, there's a very different story. Theorizing inequality, in other words, moving on from talking about patterns to trying to understand processes, uh, is always difficult in political economy, but ladies and gentlemen, that's what we're here for. <laughs> and uh, my attempt to write about this in a way that is accessible to a broad readership, not just to uh, other academics, that has led me to, uh, not for the first time, to, to a broad classification of different approaches to theory, some conservative in the tradition of Milton Friedman, Gary Becker and others, who use marginal productivity theory, human capital theory, to try to explain how we all get our just desserts. I, I don't use that phrase lightly because if you trace back in the history of neoclassical thought, there were some of the early pioneering scholars who were very explicit about that being the purpose of their theory, to explain how everyone gets their just desserts. Uh, so the, arguably the marginal productivity theory was developed precisely with that purpose in mind, to explain that reward according to productivity is the norm in a free market economy, unless distorted by market imperfections, such as uh, monopoly, oligopoly, restrictive trade practice, trade unions, God forbid, uh, and so forth. And it's that latter theme that I think the, the small L liberals have taken up uh, more vigorously in recent times, saying, well, 
perhaps your starting point is okay, that you're looking at productivity, but in practice, the distortions are so great that they swamp the, uh, the differentials that are explicable in, in productivity terms. Thus, in the hands of uh, Joseph Stieglitz, the explanation of inequality is all about rent-seeking. And rent, in this context, is not about payments for land. Uh, Stieglitz used it to refer to uh, people and groups of people who are able to extract higher incomes uh, than would be necessary to keep them engaged in those same economic activities. In other words, they're using monopoly power, political influence, whatever it takes to achieve uh, incomes above the market level that a productivity analysis would uh, justify. Then, of course, there's the radical perspective coming from a Marxian foundation, emphasising class exploitation and class-based inequalities of power. And associated with each of these uh, theoretical approaches are different views of the state. Now, I would regard myself as having always sought to operate within a broadly radical tradition of political economy. But the more I've looked at the literature about uh, explanations of the recent trends in inequality around the world, the more I've become convinced that some blending or partnership, you might say, of liberal and radical perspectives is both desirable and necessary. Um, Stieglitz is being awarded the Sydney Peace Prize this year and he'll be uh, here to accept that prize and no doubt making a lot of speeches, talking about rent seekers, the problems of growing inequality, and I'll be present clapping my hands and cheering along with the rest of them. So I think that the liberal perspective is extraordinarily useful in highlighting the nature of some of these problems. The differences, of course, come from the question of what is to be done, whether ameliorative reforms are desirable, sufficient, uh, possible or whether more radical transformations uh, need to be on the agenda. But the two perspectives can certainly come together in helping us to explain what has been driving the disparities between rich and poor over recent decades. Uh, my preferred starting point is in a sort of a in, in, in a liberal camp, uh, with the theory of circular and cumulative causation. Those of you who studied institutional political economy will surely have come across this way of thinking that derives from Thorstein Veblen, but was developed in particular by Gunnar Myrdal, the, the Swedish institutional economist, uh, also to some extent by the British post-Keynesian uh, uh, Nicky Cowdor, and, and others to really formalise in economic jargon uh, what most people refer to as vicious circles. Vicious and virtuous circles, depending <coughs> upon whether they're taking you up to, to riches and, uh, and uh, social advancement, or, or, or vicious cycles that imprison people in uh, ever deepening. Uh, problems of marginalisation and social exclusion. Perhaps the most obvious example of that in relation to the inequality story is inheritance. Uh, liberals bang on a lot about um, choice. Well, the most important choice affecting any of our lives is, of course, the choice of our parents. And I, I hope you made that choice as wisely as you could, because a lot follows from it. Uh, if I anticipate the, the what is to be done story, any uh, attempt to rein in growing inequalities that doesn't get to inheritance is going to be uh, a failure. I'm uh, sorry to say this, ladies and gentlemen, uh, particularly the older ones among you, uh, but this has got to be on the agenda. But also, if I can bring in the spatial dimension here, it's clear that where you live, 
also has a major bearing on economic opportunities. Whether you live in an affluent uh, upper North Shore suburb or, or in uh, a more marginalised place with poor local facilities, perhaps suffering even spatial discrimination because of coming from the wrong side of the tracks. So those processes, I think, interacting with contemporary political changes, globalization, financialization, neoliberalism, uh, urbanization itself, which has massive redistributions of income and wealth embedded into its normal operations, and uh, processes of technological change that generate uh, enormous winners and big losers. All of these interact together. And my chapter on this really just seeks to make that weaving of, of stories that are familiar, I think, to any modern political economist, looked at from a political economy of inequality perspective. And, again, somewhat anticipating uh, the what is to be done question, recognising that the countervailing tendencies uh, generated historically by trade unions and social democratic states also have to be part of the story. So the, 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 the conceptual part of, of this uh, middle section of the book is all about trying to see the connections between formal theoretical constructions and these more descriptive approaches to seeing what's been happening in the world around us over the last uh, 25, 30, 40 years. That plus that. Oh, I'll skip that one. Well, so what? That's, that's the next political economic question, isn't it? Why does it matter anyway? Why, why are we concerned? Well, my chapter on this seeks to organise a whole array of different arguments and evidence in a reasonably systematic way, moving through from uh, economic considerations to do with productivity, growth, stability, social effects, social problems, social mobility, environmental effects, political effects, changing the nature of the state and the democratic process, and challenges to human rights. I'll give you a little foretaste of, of some of the, the evidence that I, I parade there. Uh, the evidence on the economic effects, somewhat uh, deliciously, comes from bodies like the International Monetary Fund and the OECD, which in recent times have totally reversed their earlier story about how incentivation is necessary for economic progress. Now they're saying that uh, the, the best economic performance are typically those that have uh, reigned in inequality. Here's some other parts of the story. Oh, this one comes from Wilkinson and Pickett, a little diagram showing the fairly high correlation between the incidence of social problems and, uh, and the extent of income inequality. There's the United States almost out of picture at the top, with, with on uh, Piketty, uh, sorry, Wilkinson and Pickett's index, which is based upon mental health, physical health, obesity, um, prison incarceration rates, levels of educational attainment, low levels of educational attainment, because we're looking here at an index of problems. Um, uh, the countries which have the highest inequality typically have the highest intensity of those, uh, those problems. Moving on to social mobility. Again, not altogether surprising correlation. The United States, high inequality, low social mobility. Notwithstanding all the ideology that pervades American society about how anyone can get to the top if they work hard. Well, the evidence suggests otherwise. Social mobility here is measured according to the relativity of people's incomes and the incomes of their parents. No, on the whole, the more unequal society, the less is the likelihood 
that you'll sort of escape from your, your background factors into uh, the land of opportunity. Health problems, yes, uh, inequality, homicide, yeah. Uh, the size of these circles is uh, influenced by the size of the population in different countries, hence the US is big. But compare it with Japan, for example, at the other extreme here, we've got a high inequality, a killing society, and we've got a, uh, a low inequality, uh, less hazardous society. Carbon emissions, Danny Dawling's book presents us with some evidence which I've extracted here. Again, a similar picture. Australia is a bit off the, uh, the diagonal. We're worse than you would expect if we were just predicting on the basis of inequality. Singapore's off the diagonal the other way. A, a, a compact city state, uh, well served by a public transport system, a, uh, a sprawling big country, poorly served by public transport. <coughs> but in, in general, the, there's a, I mean, these calculations are never perfect because there's so many uh, specific features uh, uh, associated with individual countries. But it's suggestive that if we're concerned about environmental issues, uh, tackling them in conjunction with uh, pursuit of greater equity might, might be an uh, uh, appropriate way to go. Lots of other arguments too paraded, some of which come from Stieglitz in particular, I think he's very good on the way in which inequality corrupts the state, uh, the way in which people with private wealth and power in effect undermine democracy. It's a big story, Stieglitz tells it well, and I think it's crucially important. Not altogether surprising the political economists, uh, the Marxist theory of the state has always pointed to the dominant uh, influence uh, of, of the capitalist class and uh, more general reflections on the nature of capitalism and democracy have always suggested uh, a, an inherent tension. If democracy is about one person, one vote, and capitalism is about one dollar, one vote, one should not be surprised that the more the inequality of dollars, the greater the tensions uh, between the economy and the political process. I'll skip this part of the story, but actually I think this is rather interesting. It's, it gets it more into a social psychological realm of saying, well, does money matter that much anyway? Uh, uh, about 50 years ago now, I think it was maybe 40, 50, uh, an economist named Richard Easterlin pointed out that as societies get richer, their people typically don't get any happier, based upon what they say in social surveys. Something of a puzzle, and uh, I think economists, frankly, have always ignored that, because it's it, it very discomforting for the whole construction of their analysis if, if higher income isn't the way to social progress and social well-being, then uh, they don't know what else they could base their analysis on. Now, historically, that wasn't an unreasonable assumption. The eradication of poverty fairly reliably makes people happier. But beyond a certain point, uh, there's no... The, the correlation seems to peter out. Uh, the neoclassical economist A.C. Pigou predicted that back in the 1930s in his book on the, econ the economics of welfare, using a simple marginal, diminishing marginal utility theory, said that, uh, yeah, the, the first few dollars, they, they really help you to improve your well-being, your satisfaction, your utility, but after a while, diminishing returns set in, uh, and uh, therefore there's a case for taking money off rich people and giving it to poor people because the net effect would be to create a happier society. Oh, Christ, how did we get there? Close that down. <laughs> that, that, that line of reasoning had to be closed down. 
neoclassical economists come in and say, oh, you can't do interpersonal comparisons of utility, blah, 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 <coughs> end of story. But I wanted to revisit all of that story and say, well, perhaps if we not only revisit the Pigovian type argument, but layer in considerations of inequality more explicitly, then we may well be able to resolve the, uh, the so-called Easterlin paradox. And indeed, I, I think, you know, one can't prove it, I think the, the argument that, in, that bringing inequality into the story, bringing in consideration of positional goods that we can't all have, shows that getting richer without getting more equal is, is uh, a, a hedonic treadmill to know. Well, turning to what is to be done, people commonly look to the state to drive change. I've got three chapters in the book about how this might be done. Uh, through taxation, the traditional focus of redistribution, jiggling with those tax rates, uh, play, uh, playing winners and losers uh, in the annual Australian budget as uh, ScoMo did a couple of weeks back, uh, yeah. and uh, my, my chapter on, on, on that, uh, I think it's not too bad. <laughs> <laughs> but really, the, the, the more interesting action is in relation to what might be called pre-distribution. Things that could change the distribution of income before we get to the tax and transfer stage. What um, arrangements for corporate behaviour, for example, might uh, uh, limit the high CEO salaries, what arrangements for cooperative ownership might uh, produce incomes that don't need to be so radically redistributed because they're more equitably determined in the first instance. The issue of a, a, a basic income give quite a lot of attention to and indeed uh, have become increasingly convinced that if we're talking about progressive reforms that has to be a bedrock element in the process. In that, uh, at one stage, uh, just towards the end of the book, I set out a program of radical reforms, as I argue, that would test the capacity of the state, both within nations and between nations, to bring about more equitable outcomes. But let's leave that till discussion. By way of conclusion, I'd simply draw your attention to the many obstacles to progress. Uh, this is, of course, where liberals and radicals sometimes part company, because uh, whereas liberals are often happy to present their menu of desirable reforms and uh, perhaps go on speaking to us, advocating how the world ought to be a better place, uh, radical political economists are more inclined to look at, at the obstacles. And, uh, my chapter on this simply tries to analyse them in the same way, rather than just saying it's all hopeless but to analyse them in terms of the nature of well, four eyes, ignorance, ideologies, interests and institutions, institutions including states, corporations, unions, NGOs, think tanks, etc., including educational institutions and the <coughs> economic profession, and asking how the obstacles to progress that each of those presents may be addressed through combinations of education, critique, exposure, challenge activism of, of various kinds. This, uh, I venture to suggest, is um, an attempt to blend uh, pessimism of the intellect with optimism of the will. So, that's my story, and I welcome your questions, comments, uh, suggestions for public burning or whatever. <laughs> Thank you very much.